We are continuing in our series, Rooted, looking at the book of Colossians. In today's section of the letter, Paul is letting the Colossians know a little bit more about him. Because as you remember, he has not actually met them face to face. So he's letting them know a little bit more about his purpose in writing this letter. And he's going to go into some teaching in the latter half of this letter. Starting next week, we're going to look at chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 2. Sorry, chapter 2, starting in verse 6 reverse that, and onward in Colossians, where Paul seems to be dealing with some specific situations within the Colossian community. And we move from what we looked at last week, the cosmic revelation of who Christ is in this beautiful poem, and we're going to move into some of the realities that the local Colossian church community is experiencing. So many scholars believe that Paul is specifically teaching on certain things because the Colossians are being exposed to teachings that are against Christ. They're false teachings. Um, in our passage today, in chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. I don't get the sense that the Colossians are specifically believing or participating in false teachings necessarily, or else we might get a very different tone from Paul. Uh, he can get a little bit more prophetic, a little bit more pointed in his tone when people are doing such things. Um, in our passage this morning, Paul says that he, Christ, is the one that we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone. Now, sometimes in Paul's letters, he has a little bit more of that admonishing tone, and sometimes he has a bit more of the teaching tone. Uh, in Colossians, it seems to be a little bit more teaching compared to, for example, the book of Galatians. Uh, in Galatians, starting in verse 6, he literally says to the church, I am astonished that you so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So for the people in Galatia, they were specifically following teachings that were contrary to Christ, engaging in false teachings. Yet throughout Colossians, Paul has a really positive tone with the Colossian readers. He commends their faith, and, and it seems like he's more so just teaching as a warning and reminding them of who Christ is and the teachings that they should be following. Additionally, the idea of watching out for false teachers, this is something that comes out through, throughout Scripture. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells his listeners, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Paul echoes this teaching in Acts, where when he's leaving the church in Ephesus, he instructs them before he goes, and he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flocks of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. False teachers are not only something to be aware of, but they are described with such powerful imagery as wolves that are going to attack the flock of the church. This is a common teaching throughout the New Testament. As I mentioned, over the next few weeks, we're going to look into some of the specific teachings that, call, that Paul is calling out uh, to the Colossians. So, for example, in chapter 2, um, Paul calls out strict regulations for food, drink, and festivals. He talks about ascetic practices and transcend transcendent mystical worship, sensory restrictions and ascetic practices and religious devotion. These are some of the things that are false teachings that the Colossians need to be aware of and instead focus on the truth found in Christ. All in all, the teachings in Colossians um, that Paul is concerned about and some of the things that the Colossians are hearing that are contrary to Christ they're sometimes referred to as the Colossian heresy or the Colossian teaching. Another way of looking at it is to refer to the, these false teachings as transcendent ascetic philosophy. So transcendent is this, it, it seeks heavenly wisdom and spiritual perfection that transcends the supposed limitations of the body. So these would be teachings that, that want you to move past your body into some transcendent state. And then ascetic teachings are such that seek the subjugation of the weak body in order to be free from the domination of troublesome spirits and powers. So these are kind of the teachings that the Colossians would be, be encountering in their community, in their culture. And Paul says that they have the appearance of wisdom. They maybe sound like good ideas. They maybe sound like good teachings, but they lack any value. And we'll get into more of these specific ways that Paul is addressing transcendent ascetic philosophy within Colossians. But for our passage today, this is really just the beginning of Paul's concern, and it's his warnings about these kinds of false teachings. 
So as I mentioned, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 4, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Paul is specifically bringing up deceptive intentions and specious reasoning, which is reasoning that gives the appearance of being real and true, but is actually wrong. Here we have a bit of creative wordplay that Paul is using. So both of these Greek words um, that are translated as deceive and translated as fine-sounding have within it the word log. It's the root word, and it is where we get the word logos. Now, who is referred to logos of God or the word of God throughout scripture? There's like nine people here. I'm sure one of them knows. Jesus. Jesus is referred to as logos, as the word of God. In fact, in Colossians itself, Paul repeatedly refers to logos. He says, word of truth, the word of God, which is in our section today, word of Christ, and the word preached. So transcendent ascetic philosophy may give the appearance of wisdom and knowledge, but in Christ we have the true root of wisdom and knowledge. Transcendent ascetic philosophy is just words. In Christ we have the word. Paul writes in 2 verse 2 to 3 that my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, this is the Christ that Paul talked about as the supremacy that we looked at last week. And instead of transcending past Christ to some kind of wisdom beyond, Paul wants them to know that it is all about Christ, that we need to root ourselves in him. Again, like we talked about last week, Paul wants his readers to know Jesus, to understand Jesus. The mystery that was the mysterious before is fully known in Christ. And by fully knowing Christ, we are better able to avoid false teachings. But this takes effort on our part, as well as emboldening by the Spirit of God. At the end of our passage, Paul delights in their discipline and how firm their faith is. Earlier, he says that he strenuously contends with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in him. Here's the sense that the journey of faith is this almost kind of like symbiotic relationship where God emboldens us by his spirit through Christ at work within us, as well as works in us through our own effort and discipline. That's why we talk a lot about habits here at Greenfield, about having a rule of life that kind of helps us on, in our relationship with God. So to speak personally for a moment, um, my life verse is 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, which is for God to not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. And for me, that means that I believe that the spirit of God is in me and he's at work in, within me to empower me to do all that he's called me to do. But he's also given me self-discipline. I'm made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. And that means that we have some God-given self-discipline and the ability to set up habits and healthy practices that allow us to grow and allow us to do what God has called us to do. Now, there have been seasons in my life where this is a lot easier. <laughs> and there are seasons in my life, basically, since I've had children, where it is a lot more difficult to set up consistent habits for my own spiritual growth. But it, nonetheless, I do believe it's a combination of the spirit at work within us and the way that God has made us that helps us grow towards spiritual maturity, so that we can better do the work that God has called us to do. Now, moving on, I want to draw your attention to a couple things more in this section of Colossians before we move to application. So the very first verse is one that may cause some confusion. It kind of sounds strange to our ears. It says in verse 24, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, at a surface level read of this verse, it could possibly be understood, or we might take it to mean, that Paul is saying that, there, that the suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross isn't enough. Like there was some kind of quota of suffering that was expected on Good Friday, and Paul is doing his job to finish that quota. Obviously, this would lead us down to some very different interpretations about Christ's death and resurrection, and is also not consistent with, to what Paul has taught about the supremacy of Christ and the reconciliation that happened through the cross. 
So first of all, we need to recognize that there's this kind of turn of phrase that Paul uses in Colossians that's difficult to translate. So instead of thinking of what is still lacking, it may ring better in our ears or better be understood as what is part of or what is also experienced in terms of Christ's suffering. Now, secondly, the word translated as afflictions, which we, we see here as afflictions, is the Greek word philipsis. And it's never used anywhere else in scripture to refer to Christ's sufferings on the cross. And actually, the word is often used to describe oppression. So such as imperial oppression by Egypt or Babylon on God's people, oppression of the poor by the rich people, or difficult times and oppression believers might experience because of their faith, especially from authorities. So for example, in the parable of the sower in Matthew, Jesus uses this word, philipsis, and it is translated as oppression. So in this parable, Jesus tells a story about a farmer, which is so appropriate. I mean, this is May long weekend. How many of you have been putting in your gardens? Any green thumbs? Yes, we have a green thumb back there. I'm sure not the only one. I do not have a green thumb. I ha we got hanging baskets. We'll see if they last past May long weekend. All right, so in the parable of the sower, Jesus tells the story of a farmer who goes out to sow seed. So the farmer is scattering out seed. Some fall along the path and are eaten up by birds. Some fall on rocky places and there's not enough soil for the roots to go down deep. Some are scorched by the sun. Some fall among thorns that when they grow together, choke the plants. And some fall on good soil and produce a crop. Now in chapter 13 in Matthew, where we find this story, we also have Jesus explain exactly what he means by this parable, which we don't always have in scripture. So it's pretty good to pay attention to that. He goes on to compare the circumstances of the seed to those of different kinds of believers and hearers of the gospel. So in verse 20 and 21, he explains that the seed that falls on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word, receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Trouble and persecution is the same word translated that we have affliction in our passage today. Now, the message translation tries to get at this distinction and attempt to clear up this translation discomfort. The message says, I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of that suffering. When I became a servant in this church, I experienced the suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. Now, I would like to suggest to you that Paul is not claiming that there is anything incomplete in the reconciling work of the cross, but instead he's identifying himself with Christ, that the suffering he's experiencing is a product of his cruciform faith. Cruciformity or cruciformed faith is probably the best way to describe Paul's faith and how he understands faith. For Paul, the cross is central to his theology. It is central to his understanding of God. And through the cross, we see the means of grace by which God is known. On the cross, Jesus was fully humbled, as it says in Philippians 2, and he was obedient to death on the cross. And for Paul, to be like Christ as one author puts it, is to be a living exegesis of this narrative of Christ, which means as followers of Christ, we also empty ourselves. We let go of our own selfish ambition, our own humble pursuits, and we humble ourselves before Christ. And in being faithful to Christ, most likely we will experience some amount of suffering. All the while we point people to Christ and we point people to the cross. Paul in particular was oppressed by the Roman Empire for his beliefs and his work in the church. He literally is writing Colossians from prison. And as Walsh and Keysmat point out in my favorite book about Colossians, they say, just as Jesus' death was the result of oppressive political maneuvering on the part of both Jewish leaders and the Romans, who were threatened by the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God, so the continued oppression the Christian community in Colossae faced was the result of them proclaiming an alternative kingdom and living in subjection to a Lord other than Caesar. Paul uses thelipsis, or he uses afflictions, oppression, to describe his own suffering on behalf of the church, 
connecting the oppression that Jesus experienced to the oppression that Paul is now experiencing at the hands of the empire. And just as Christ overcame all authorities and powers at the cross, so also the church continues to bear the fury of these powers in anticipation of their final subjugation, their final defeat to Christ at his return. Now, N.T. Wright further suggests, and we see this in the message translation, that Paul saw the suffering he experienced as essentially taking some of the spiritual heat away from the Colossians, or for, uh, taking some of the spiritual heat away from those who were maybe less strong and less experienced in their faith. The authorities and dark powers around us that are rendered useless by the cross are not happy when anyone follows Jesus Christ and will absolutely launch spiritual attacks in order to cause believers to doubt, falter, or perhaps walk away from Christ. Paul saw himself as joyfully suffering, as, or strenuously contending, as it says, as almost a lightning rod, meaning he is suffering oppression instead of the young church. He's taking away some of the spiritual heat. Now, clearly from this passage, we see that Paul saw his purpose was to spread the gospel, and his purpose is to serve the church, to serve the body of Christ. In this passage alone, we have multiple times that Paul points this out. He says, I'm suffering for you for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant. I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I am contending for you and for Laodicea and for those who have not even met me, and so on. And in true Paul style, we get this kind of joyful look of suffering bringing joy. We see this in the book of Philippians, which is one of the most joyful books in all of scripture. Paul genuinely experiences a great deal of joy in the face of suffering. He saw purpose and benefit to his suffering. Overall, Paul would see sufferings and oppression as a sign that he, or anyone else experiencing such things, is being faithful. Dark powers wouldn't mess with anyone who wasn't following Christ. Now, this sentiment is reflected in other of Paul's letters, like in Romans. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul would believe and encourage us as well, that any kind of oppressive forces launched at a believer is ultimately powerless against us as the body of Christ, because Christ has defeated all those powers. One author wrote that Paul can respond, let the empire rage in its fury. Let it strike me with all it has. Let it throw me into prison. Let it mobilize its military and legal structures of oppression. I know that all of this is ultimately disarmed and pacified at the cross. All oppression and spiritual attacks are the desperate final cries of a defeated power at the cross by Jesus Christ. There's also another aspect to suffering that N.T. Wright talks about. He goes on to say that all Christians will suffer for their faith in one way or another, if not outwardly, then inwardly, through the long, slow battle with temptation or sickness, the agonizing anxieties of Christian responsibilities for a family or a church, the constant doubts and uncertainties which accompany the obedience of faith, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, taken up as they are within the call to follow Christ. If you're wondering, like I was, what, uh, where the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, it comes from a quote from Hamlet, actually, and from that famous soliloquy that starts, to be or not to be, that is the question. And it is essentially referring to just kind of the pains of being alive. Sometimes it's hard. This kind of suffering is different than the kind of suffering that Paul is experiencing due to oppression from authorities. Because the suffering that lands Paul in jail is one that he knowingly chose out of his commitment to preach the gospel. He felt a specific call on his life, and others feel that same call as well, though some do not. Yet Paul is also likely preparing the Colossians and later the Laodicean readers. He's preparing them about the tougher side of being a follower of Christ can have. The questions that arise when we're suffering, the doubts and difficulties that make faith just difficult at times. Yet Paul always couples these sufferings with the joy that almost unbelievably accompanies it. Because as believers, as followers of Christ, we have Christ with us as we go through whatever suffering. And as our roots go deeper into Christ, 
we are able to withstand whatever comes our way. We have already learned that Paul's overarching concern in this letter to the Colossians is maturity. Everything he is writing about is to move the Colossians further down the road towards spiritual maturity, helping them root in Christ, build up in them strength and resilience. And it's interesting how going through suffering better prepares us for suffering. It matures us as we experience it. Therefore, as one author puts it, entering the story of a suffering God, following the Messiah who brings peace through the blood of the cross by sharing in his suffering, we bear the image of that God and that Messiah and thereby become mature, complete, and whole in Christ. In our passage this morning, that sentiment about maturity is clear. In verse 8, Paul says, He, Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Much like the cycle of knowledge and good works that we talked about a couple weeks ago from Colossians 1, where growing in our knowledge of God helps us do good works and bear outward fruit, which in turn helps us understand God, which then helps us bear good fruit, Paul seems to suggest that as we mature and become more like Christ, we will experience suffering and oppression, which we will be able to bear as we are rooted in Christ in a deeper way, which might bring about more suffering that we will then be able to bear. If not a cycle, at the very least, suffering does kind of move us down toward the road toward greater maturity. An idea that we see in Romans, where we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. This again counteracts the teachings of the transcendent ascetic philosophy that Paul is warning the Colossians about. Where transcendent ascetic philosophy would want to transcend the supposed weakness of the body, to reach some outer body, spiritual, perfect, transcendent state. Being a believer and part of the body of Christ actually roots us in our physical body. The church is the body of Christ. God still takes on flesh in this world. Christ's body is still a living, giving presence in the church. We don't need to transcend past our bodies or the body of the church because sometimes it is in the supposed weakness or struggles that we find ourselves closer to Christ, relying on the spirit and more bonded together as a community, as a body of Christ. We want to be present in our bodies because as we are present as the body of Christ, we can share Christ's presence with those around us. This is one of the ways that God shows his presence on earth through the church as the body of Christ. But yet again, to continue from last week, we should live in such a way where the ways of Christ and the presence of God should be known in how we talk and how we live, working together to bring about conditions where everyone can live as God intended. Shalom, at peace, where everyone has exactly what they need to flourish. Now, before we go on to application about this passage, I just want to make one kind of caveat about suffering. I found this hard to uh, look into this week, just given our current climate and situation with the pandemic. While some of us in the body of Christ experience the oppressive suffering at the hands of authorities, What we are currently experiencing as the church in this pandemic is not the oppressive suffering at the hands of authorities like Paul experienced when he was thrown in jail, or like our brothers and sisters experience in places around the world, like in Turkey or in China. I am not about to be jailed for publicly sharing my faith or for preaching this morning. YouTube isn't shutting down our live feed for talking about Jesus. All our social media accounts regularly talk about Jesus all the time, and I feel safe during this pandemic as a pastor with everything that we are doing as a church. There are brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, that are afflicted because of their beliefs. Some because they have chosen maybe a more public position, and some because they live within community or countries that are oppressive to Christians, and that is very different And admittedly, if I was preaching a couple years ago on Colossians, I don't know if I would be so careful to point that out that we are not an underground church, that we are not an oppressed church right now. But unfortunately, here we are. In our passage this morning, we have seen Paul talk about suffering, specifically his suffering for the sake of the church. But we looked at suffering that the believers and us as believers experience as we grow in maturity. 
We've also looked at how Paul began to draw the reader's attention to the transcendent ascetic philosophy that was around the church in Colossae. That while these teachings around them may seem like wisdom, may seem like good practices, they actually are not rooted in Christ. Now, the application of our passage and how I would like to suggest to you that we draw these ideas together is found in chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So first, yet again, Paul's encouragement is to know Christ. Last week, after going through the, polo- the poem in Colossians, the one that talks about who Christ is, how he is before creation and all things are created through him, that he is the supremacy, I suggested that our two takeaways from last week are to know Jesus and to act like we know Jesus. And this passage again brings up that idea that we should be in Christ, that we should live like him, we should know him, that through Christ all wisdom and knowledge exists. In some ways, this takeaway or application might seem too broad, but it doesn't make it any less important. I truly want to encourage all of us to take the time to look at the Gospels, to study what Jesus said and did, and to spend time in prayer and communion with Christ. While we did talk a lot about um, this specific takeaway last week, so I don't want to spend too much time on it today, I do want to add that from this passage, but really from Paul's teaching And what we learn about the presence of God and about the Holy Spirit in our lives. Knowing God and being in Christ and having the Spirit at work within us is one of the ways we are able to withstand oppression and suffering. Now, one passage of Paul's that talks a lot about Christ, about being in Christ and being filled with the Spirit is Romans 8, which is probably one of my all-time favorite chapters in Scripture. And if you're in a time of struggle, I highly recommend reading it over and over, maybe daily for a while. Paul writes that the Spirit helps us when it comes to temptation. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, that being in Christ, we are able to withstand trouble, hardship, persecution. It talks about the love of God and how we are never separated from it. Church, we are not done with this pandemic. There are many in our church body that are suffering and struggling. Our faith is being questioned. This is difficult. We need the Spirit of God to fill us. And how incredibly appropriate to talk about that on Pentecost Sunday, a day where we acknowledge the coming of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. We need what Paul calls the energy Christ so powerfully works in us. We need to take time to be in Christ so we can handle what we are going through right now in our culture. And this brings me to the second point. In our application verse, if we look at 2, verse 2, Paul says, he wants them to be encouraged in heart and united in love. We need each other. We need to be an encouragement to one another, especially during this pandemic, but really all the time. I've said this before, but there are times in our faith when we are struggling, and I know it has helped me on a Sunday morning when I'm singing songs about how faithful and how good God is, and I'm struggling maybe to think of those things in that moment, but I can look out on a Sunday morning and I can see my brothers and sisters in Christ singing those words out and believing them. Maybe even as we know our, each other's story, when we know what we're struggling with, when we know what what sicknesses that have been healed or, or journeys we're going on in our faith, and yet we can come together and sing together and believe it together. Our faith is made stronger. And like Paul taking some of the spiritual heat off of the Colossians, there are times when those in our community who are stronger or going through an easier season of faith need to do more than their share to encourage and support and lift up those who are younger in their faith or who are in maybe a more difficult season. That's this beautiful picture we get of the body. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that uh, my son Jameson, he broke his tibia. He had a fractured tibia. He's doing a lot better now, so thank you so much for um, your prayers and your concerns about that. But it was truly amazing thing to watch this little two-year-old manage to like navigate how to move around our house without the use of his leg. His arms got so strong as he kind of like, like 
shoved his way around the whole house without using his leg. His whole other parts of his body were compensating for the fact that one part of his body just wasn't able to work. He, that's how he lovingly cared for his body. Now, often we hear in a message about the importance of unity and community, we hear the metaphor of horses being used. And I looked it up, okay? So I don't know much about horses, but I looked this up this week. Now, I learned that a single draft horse can pull up to 8,000 pounds. So that if we were to use simple math, we would assume that two draft horses together would pull twice that. So 16,000 pounds, right, Mr. Dolezal? Out there, I did math in my head. Just kidding, I wrote it down because I could not be trusted to multiply that on the fly. But actually, that is wrong. Okay, two draft horses pulling together pull not twice as much, but they actually pull three times as much. They can pull 24,000 pounds as they work together. Now get this, it goes even further. When horses work together for a long time, when they learn teamwork and unity and they understand each other, they can pull as much as four times the original load that one horse could pull by themselves. When Paul writes that he hopes the Colossians are encouraged in heart and united in love, he does so because he knows the importance of a body working together, especially in the face of false teachings and especially in the face of suffering. Now today we're gonna to take some time and pray through some of the prayer requests that you sent in. And I love doing this because we're not together, but it's a way to have more voices in our prayer time and to hear from one another and to form some kind of communal connection even though we're not together in the room. Now, as the worship team comes up, I invite you to come up. I have a couple final thoughts. Greenfield, I would like to suggest to you all this week that we need to be more intentional to encourage and love one another. Maybe you need to get out your online directory and find someone you basically haven't talked to since we stopped meeting face-to-face, -face, and you need to send them a message. Maybe spend some time in prayer and listen to the spirits nudging, like, who should I talk to this week? Who needs encouragement? Maybe you need to offer to mow someone's lawn or to drop off a banana bread, something like that. Anything to make life a little brighter for a member of our community. And maybe if you're experiencing pain and frustration and suffering, you can reach out to someone in the church body for a prayer or encouragement of any kind. Let's just try to be available to each other and practically help each other. I called today's message, Why We Do This. And the why we do this is because of Christ. But then I would like to suggest that the how we do all of this is by being emboldened by God's spirit and by doing this together as a community. Friends, I'm so thankful for our Greenfield community. I'm grateful, grateful as a pastor here who is being encouraged during Pastor Appreciation Month. It's a good time to be a pastor at Greenfield. I'm grateful as your interim pastor because I know that there are people praying for me every single week during my time. And even though we have had to adjust and pivot and then pivot again to how we do church, we are still a community. So let's be intentional to encourage one another, especially as we experience suffering or as we navigate and discern good teaching from false, and especially as we grow in maturity rooted in Christ. Will you join with me in worshiping together?